Radiation poisoning. It can happen in a blinding blue flash or while sipping a cup of tea at a fancy London hotel. Or maybe you decided to skip the safety precautions at the workplace just this once. What's the worst that can happen? Here are some of the people who found out the hard way. Before the deadly effects of radium were fully understood, the US Radium Corporation began accenting watch dials and airplane instrument faces with radium-based glow-in-the-dark paint, an innovation aimed at helping soldiers fighting overseas in World War I. Painting the dials was delicate work done by young women, who, to maintain the fine points of the brushes as they painted, wet them on their tongues. Why not use water or rag? Because that took time and some of the paint would be lost, both precious commodities. So the girls licked their brushes over and over all day long. Sure, they consumed a little radium, but the company swore it was 100% absolutely perfectly safe. Besides, radium dust made their skin glow, and some of the young women used it as a tooth whitener. I lost a tooth and two others are loose. Do you know what's wrong with me? That's how it started, basically, and from there, the girls began experiencing bone damage, most notably deterioration of the jawbone, a condition that became known as radium jaw. In 1922, 25-year-old radium worker Molly Magia died, but she was just the first. She got sick and had the broken jawbone. It never healed. In two years, she was dead. By 1927, more than 50 of the young workers were dead. Eventually, pathologist Harrison Martland developed a test to measure internal radium levels in the workers. This helped link their deaths to radiation poisoning, and some of the girls fought back. In 1928, five of the workers, dubbed the Radium Girls, sued U.S. Radium and won. They were each awarded $10,000, which would be over $189,000 today. I want to tell you about radium. A most peculiar and remarkable element. The most recognized figure in the world of radioactive studies is Madame Marie Curie, who in 1898 discovered the underlying nature of radiation. Her death due to radiation poisoning may be the least surprising, but she knowingly risked her own life to advance scientific knowledge, and her work had a monumental impact. She was a pioneer in the fields of chemistry and nuclear science at a time when female scientists were a rarity. Now, Miss Askew, please to leave my laboratory. Leave. Good thing she didn't leave. Curie's curiosity about radiation led her to choose it as a subject or a thesis. Her studies of uranium revealed that it was more than just the mineral that caused radioactivity in the ore in which it was found. As a result, she and her husband Pierre identified polonium, a substance 400 times more radioactive than uranium. Curie's further studies led to the discovery of radium, even more radioactive than polonium, and the element Curie's name is most associated with. While her achievements won her two Nobel Prizes, her regular exposure to toxic materials led to ongoing bouts of radiation poisoning. Curie died in 1934 from aplastic anemia. Even today, her papers are so radioactive that they're stored in lead boxes. If you're wondering what happened to her husband, no, he didn't die from radiation. He slipped on a wet Paris street and got run over by a horse-drawn carriage. Yeah. After the end of World War II, some Manhattan Project scientists stayed on to continue their work, including Louis Slotin. Slotin's job was to assemble the core used in atomic bombs. This precarious task, referred to as tickling the dragon's tail, involved arranging two beryllium hemispheres like a shell around the core itself to monitor what was going on inside. The procedure was super risky. If Slotin closed the hemispheres entirely, he'd set off an ionizing blast, a potential catastrophe. But Slotin loved danger. The job was perfect for him, until it wasn't. During a May 1946 experiment, Slotin was separating the two hemispheres with a screwdriver when the tool slipped and the halves closed. It was a blue flash and a release of intense radiation. Slotin pulled the hemispheres apart to stop the reaction, but in doing so, he received four times a lethal dose of radiation. He died nine days later. As the second figure in the Manhattan Project to die from radiation poisoning, his death resulted in improved safety protocols for nuclear labs. When human rights activist Alexander Litvinenko, a former KGB agent and outspoken critic of the Kremlin, died of radiation poisoning in 2006, it sounded like something out of a spy thriller. And in keeping with the thriller scenario, the polonium-210 that killed him was very likely slipped into a very British cup of tea. It was a very unique situation. Have you ever dealt with a case like this, Detective? Has anyone? On November 1st, 2006, Litvinenko, who'd been granted political asylum in the UK and was working with MI6 to round up the Russian Mafia, met with two other former Russian agents for tea at London's Millennium Hotel. It was supposed to be an ordinary business meeting, but shortly after, Litvinenko fell ill and was hospitalized. Once there, he continued to deteriorate. 
He was brought to us with symptoms and signs of bone marrow failure. In an interview from his hospital bed, Litvinenko revealed that he'd been investigating the assassination of Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya a month before. Like Litvinenko, she'd been publicly critical of the Putin regime. It wasn't a great leap to think that Litvinenko's impending death was a political assassination and that the Kremlin was behind it. In another twist befitting a former Russian spy, Litvinenko was heavily involved in the investigation of his own poisoning, even while he knew he was dying. Ever the intelligence officer, he was able to help authorities piece together the events leading up to the incident before he died on November 23, 2006. The radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. Yikes. You see, in the early days of radioactive science, physicians believed it was a miracle cure for all sorts of ailments. Unsurprisingly, this was a fatal assumption for many early adopters, including Eben Byers. A former golf champion who sustained an arm injury in 1927, Byers was prescribed Radithor, a concoction of distilled water mixed with radium and mesothorium as a healing tonic by his physician. Radithor is literally the world's first energy drink because it's supposed to transfer the energy from radium into your body. Byers felt better, so much better, that he started handing out Radithor to friends and feeding it to his racehorses. For two years, he was drinking an average of three bottles a day. He even believed it restored the virility of his youth. So, being a gentleman, he doled the stuff out to his girlfriends. But the good times came to a screeching halt in 1930 when Byers began losing his teeth. Around that time, the Federal Trade Commission filed a case against Radithor's manufacturer, Bailey Radium Laboratories, and in December 1931, Radithor was banned. It was too late for Byers, though. He'd already lost most of his lower jaw and his entire upper jaw. His bones were dissolving, and a hole had begun to develop in his skull. He died of radium poisoning in 1932. His body was so radioactive that he had to be buried in a lead-lined coffin. It wasn't only the radium girls who succumbed to the effects of radioactive paint. The scientist who created the formula, Dr. Sabin Arnold von Sochaki, was a victim of his own invention, which he cleverly called Undark. Dr. von Sochaki believed that radium was the lighting of the future. In a 1926 document titled The Wonders of Radium, he was quoted as saying, The time will doubtless come when you will have in your own home a room lighted entirely by radium. Dr. Von Sochaki was convinced the radium consumed by the watch painters would eventually dissolve. It was a fatal mistake. Having inhaled plenty of radium over his years working with the substance, Von Sochaki developed aplastic anemia, which prevented his body from producing new blood cells. So, yes, Undark led to him being unalive. According to his obituary, the side effects were gruesome, including his front teeth gone and fingers up to the second knuckle were black as a result of radium necrosis. Look, nobody wants to hold the title of world's most radioactive man, but someone has to. And it's Hisachi Aochi, a worker at a uranium processing plant at Tokaimura, Japan. On September 30th, 1999, Aochi was one of 49 people exposed to radiation in what was at the time Japan's worst nuclear accident. In terms of radiation exposure, seven sieverts is considered deadly. If you've never heard the word sievert, it's a standardized measure of basically how much damage radiation is likely to do to humans. We're talking cancer, genetic damage, and a combo platter of other horrific outcomes. In the 1999 accident, Auchi received 17 sieverts, more than anyone else ever had. The accident was caused by human error. Workers were mixing enriched uranium with nitric acid for reactor fuel. This was usually done in quantities of 2.4 kilograms at a time by an automated process, but the company was under financial pressure. So on that day, the workers took a fatal shortcut. Rather than using machinery, they mixed up 16 kilograms of the highly radioactive fuel by hand in a plain old stainless steel bucket. If you're thinking that sounds stupid, it does, and the workers paid dearly for it. Ouchie was leaning over the tank without protective gear when there was a blue flash. He immediately collapsed. The uncontrollable chain reaction that followed released radiation for nearly 20 hours. Ouchie was transported to the National Institute of Radiological Sciences, where tests revealed his white blood cell count was close to zero. Despite multiple transfusions and a stem cell transplant, Auchi died after an excruciating 83 days of suffering, during which he cried tears of blood and his skin blistered and fell off. Anyone who worked on the Manhattan Project knew they were risking accidental exposure to radiation, but physicist Harry Dalian would live and ultimately die to regret it. In August 1945, while testing what would later become known as the Demon Core, Dalian was building a wall of tungsten carbide blocks around the highly radioactive core when he accidentally dropped one. In a worst-case scenario, the brick landed directly on the core, 
causing an instant burst of radioactivity. But rather than step away, Dalian tried to grab the block back, exposing himself to a double dose of raw radiation. Dalian was working alone to find safety protocols. Despite receiving emergency medical attention, Dalian fell into a coma and died on September 15, 1945, 25 days after the accident. Going forward, safety rules were put in place requiring that at least two people be on deck during experiments, although in this case, that arrangement likely would have doomed a second scientist to a painful death. You don't have to be a scientist to know that radioactive materials need to be handled with extreme caution. Certainly Douglas Crowfoot, a professional radiographer, should have known this, but between alcohol and general carelessness, he messed up, and it proved fatal. Crowfoot was an oil field worker who used x-ray tech to evaluate welds and pipelines. To do this, he used machinery that contained either iridium or cobalt, both highly radioactive. He probably shouldn't have had such a sensitive job considering that he had 16 arrests on his lengthy rap sheets and a fondness for heavy drinking. Then there's the fact that in December 1980, Crowfoot was suspected of stealing a radiography machine like one he used for work. Some might call that grounds for dismissal. The machine was mysteriously returned on January 5, 1981, but two weeks later, Crowfoot showed up at a hospital with extensive radiation burns. Based on the location of the burns, authorities suspected Crowfoot carried a radioactive capsule around in his pants pocket, which seems like a good way to end up dead. That's exactly what happened. Over the next very painful six months, Crowfoot's flesh slowly deteriorated until the radiation burn reached his organs. He died in late July 1981, the first radiation poisoning death in the U.S. since the Manhattan Project nearly 40 years earlier. In 1958, Los Alamos chemical operator Cecil Kelly was mixing a vat of hazardous materials, a brew that included plutonium residue. His associates were outside the vat room when they saw a blue flash. Soon after, Kelly appeared, dazed and screaming that he was burning up. He'd been exposed to radiation for just 200 microseconds. That's 200 millionths of a second. That was all it took for him to lose muscle coordination and feel like he was on fire. Tests revealed that he'd been run through with a 3600 rad, a combination of neutron and gamma ray exposure that was more than three times the fatal exposure limit. Other reports list the exposure received by his heart at closer to 12,000 rad. Either way, within six hours, Kelly's lymphocytes were gone. By the 24-hour mark, his bone marrow had stopped producing new blood cells. About 35 hours after the accident, Kelly died. Tests performed on his body after his death were the beginnings of the Los Alamos Human Tissue Analysis Program. 